Uh, thank you, Rodney, and thank you, team, for leading us. Uh, my name is Tom. I'm a pastor here at Sturgeon Valley, one of the pastors. Thank you for those of you who are joining with us online as well and for making time to be here. And I just want to share with you guys today some, a special moment in, uh, in uh, one of our church family's life. And uh, I'm just going to come down here. And I don't know if the lights can follow me, but I want to uh, introduce you to, if you don't know, Gerald. This is Gerald Linden back here. Gerald. And uh, Gerald is meeting his birth brother, and it's the first time in 64 years they've been together. And so that happened this morning here at church. So there's a lot of history there and story and everything. So God's blessing on you guys. And as you begin to reconnect in this way, they were planning on doing it a couple of years ago. And uh, COVID, of course, interrupted all of our lives. But uh, so glad that uh, that could happen today. And uh, God bless you guys. Well, I want to begin today by telling you about a story from my life. Um, many years ago, a guy booked an appointment to come and see me and uh, when he arrived I could tell that he was he was really troubled and uh, so he shared with me that he had just been released from prison and he was asking for help on how to integrate or reintegrate back into society and I was brand new in the ministry I had no experience so I had no clue how to help this guy at all so I asked him, so, well, what, what do you need help in? What do you need help for? And he said, well, I could use a reference um, for a landlord because I'm living in a motel and no landlord will give me a place to live because of my criminal record. I could use a reference for a job because I've applied for jobs and no employer will give me a job because of my criminal record. I could use some help emotionally because of the things that happened to me while in prison and spiritually I have no clue how to reconnect with God and I was like I have no clue what to do so all I did for him was pray for him which is important and then I, I connected him with uh, someone a colleague of mine that had more experience and knowledge about how to help people leaving a correctional facility or or a jail um, to integrate back into society. Now, my old hardline self might also thought these thoughts about him. Well, he deserves that. He made his choices. These are the consequences. I'm sure glad I'm not like him. I'm sure glad I didn't make those choices. He's got to live with it. And yet, as I was thinking about this and over the years, I began to realize, I don't think that's how Jesus would have responded to this guy. And, and it didn't equate. I, I couldn't kind of put it all together. But how troubled he was and how broken he was troubled me. And as time has gone on, I've become more aware of my own sinfulness, my own brokenness. I've accumulated my own wounds and hurts. And if you live long enough, you know that life is going to bring you some wounds and some hurts and some hard things. Sometimes because of what we do or don't do. Other times because of what people do or don't do for us. Or just because of what life brings to us. And as humans, we then try to deal with these hurts. We try to deal with these wounds in, in ways that we've heard about or that other people might have tried to deal with it. So we maybe bury it or we try to ignore it or we try to escape from it or we try to deaden the pain. And none of these ultimately work, but we try it because that's what everyone else is trying and we may wonder, are, am I ever going to be whole? Am I ever going to be completely healed? And we may also ask the question, does God care about the pain in my life, the hurts in my life? And I wonder if the people during Ezekiel's time asked 
a similar question. Well, they had endured multiple difficulties. They endured the national humiliation of their country being invaded by a foreign power and defeated. They had been forcibly deported by the Babylonians to live in the Babylon region, so they had to leave everything behind. Their standard of living went way down from wherever they were at. And any hope that they had of returning to their own lives was smashed when the Babylonians returned to Jerusalem, destroyed the city, and destroyed the temple. There was no going back to the life that they knew. And all this happened because of centuries of unfaithfulness by the people of God towards God. And the prophet Ezekiel had been talking to them about all of this for the first two-thirds of the book that we've looked at. Yet there was hope. And the Lord promised to restore them. And the Lord promised to renew them as a people. And so we've seen, like in Ezekiel 37, the vision of the valley of dry bones and those dry bones being given life to become a great army. Or we saw the vision in chapters 38 and 39 of Gog, the evil king and his super army, and the Lord striking them down to protect his people. And we saw last week the vision of the Lord's return to a new perfect temple and his desire to dwell with his people. So the Lord did provide reasons for hope, but his provision goes even farther. And in our last message on Ezekiel today, we are going to see the Lord's deep concern for the healing of the earth and the healing of people like you and me. And I hope today that you're going to see the Lord's healing and life-giving ministry that he offers you wherever you're at in life with whatever wounds or hurts that you are carrying and that he offers us as a community as we go forward into this fall and this year as God has called us. And I hope by the end of our time you will have a clear answer to that question. Does God care about the pain in my life? And so please find Ezekiel 47 in your Bibles or on your devices, or it's on page 626 in the Bibles in front of you there. And this will conclude the Ezekiel series, as next week we'll be starting with a new focus on a new vision, and we're going into the book of Colossians in the fall. But today, Ezekiel 47, verses 1 to 12. So this is Ezekiel talking, and he's talking about the heavenly messenger that we met last week, who is taking him on this tour through the temple grounds. Then he, the messenger, brought me, Ezekiel, back to the door of the temple, and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. And the water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. Then he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gate, that faces toward the east, and behold, the water was trickling out on the south side. Going on eastward with a measuring line in his hand, the man measured a thousand cubits, and then led me through the water, and it was ankle deep. And he measured a thousand and led me through the water, and it was knee deep. Again he measured a thousand and led me through the water, and it was waist deep. Again he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass through, for the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in, a river that could not be passed through. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river, and as I went back, I saw on the bank of the river very many trees on the one side and on the other. And he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah and enters the sea. When the water flows into the sea, the water will become fresh. And wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live, and there will be very many fish. For this water goes there, that the waters of the sea may become fresh, so everything will live where the river goes. Fishermen will stand beside the sea. From Engedi to Enegalaim, it will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be of very many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. But its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They are to be left for salt. And on the banks, on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. 
Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. So last week we saw the heavenly messenger take Ezekiel on a tour of the new temple. And if you have a bulletin or a handout today, you can see the same picture that we looked at last week from the Bible Project highlighted. So if you look in the top right of the picture, you see Ezekiel standing there with that tall guy who is the heavenly messenger and he has his measuring tools in his hand. And on the left side of the picture, you see the throne of God, the chariot throne of God, coming back towards the temple. So this is the return of the glory of God to the temple to indicate God's desire to be present with his people. And this week's passage, 47, focuses on that stream that starts at the stairway in the center of the temple. So see that stream coming out and flowing down. So the bottom half of the picture is what we're talking about this week. And the messenger takes Ezekiel to that front door and he sees this water that's flowing out of the temple. And the messenger then takes Ezekiel outside of the temple walls and Ezekiel sees the water trickling out. And he uses the word trickle. So imagine the sound of uh, pouring a bottle of water out. You know, the gurgling sound that that makes. That's the kind of sound that he's describing there. And it flows down from the temple, out the gate. And the messenger then walks a thousand cubits east, which is about 1,500 to 1,700 feet, or about a little less than 500 meters. And he takes his measuring tools with him and he measures these thousand cubits and then Ezekiel notes the water is now ankle deep. So you know what it's like to walk through ankle deep water. You can walk through it. It's not too big of a problem. And the messenger goes another thousand cubits and it's knee deep. So you know, walking out into a lake, and if you get into knee-deep water, it's a little bit more difficult to walk, but it's there. And, and, And so this stream is increasing in depth, and there are no other streams that are feeding this stream. It's coming just from the temple. And they go another thousand cubits, and it's now now waist deep. And if you're waist deep out in a lake or in a pool, you know it's harder to walk because there's there's so much water there. So this little trickle of water coming out of the temple has grown to be a stream waist deep. And in verse 5, they walk another thousand cubits, and Ezekiel sees an impassable river. Now think about the rivers that you saw this past summer. Maybe you went camping. Maybe you stopped by the side of the road. To listen to the river, you hear the roaring or the rushing or you just see the power of the river going. That's what Ezekiel sees. And the messenger then asks Ezekiel, son of man, have you seen this? Are you taking this all in? This little trickle from the temple has become a river that is impassable with no help from any other stream at any other place along the way. So in the first five verses, the heavenly messenger shows Ezekiel the ever-increasing flow of this water from the temple. And commentators have noticed that this river recalls the rivers in the Garden of Eden. So in Genesis 2.10, we read, A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. So there again, you have that principle of one stream multiplying into something bigger. And here in Ezekiel, the same thing happens. You have a trickle of water that turns, to an impa- turns into an impassable river. And this picture of the river from God's presence is picked up and repeated throughout the Old Testament. Like in Psalm 46, verse 4, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. Or Joel 3.18, and in that day the mountains shall drip sweet wine, and hills shall flow with milk, and all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water. And a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord and and water the valley. 
or Zechariah 14, verse 8. On that day, living water shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea, half to the western sea, and it shall continue in summer as in winter. So this is an ever-flowing stream. So the prophets throughout the Old Testament pick up Eden's river from the garden and use it to portray the future with this glorious river coming from God to bring life. And that's what Ezekiel does in chapter 47 as well in describing this vision that he sees. Now remember the messenger and Ezekiel are standing in waist high water looking somehow downstream to see that the river has become impassable and then the messenger takes Ezekiel to the banks of the river, the side of the river and Ezekiel notices in verse 7, I saw on the river bank very many trees on one side and on the other. Well where else in the Bible do we see a place with very many trees? Garden of Eden. Genesis 2.9, and out of the ground the Lord made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So Ezekiel again is using Garden of Eden imagery to help him describe his vision. And next, in Ezekiel 47 verse 8, the messenger informs Ezekiel of the purpose of this river. He says, this water flows towards the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah and enters the sea. So this means that the river will go east from Jerusalem, flow down into the Dead Sea Valley, and end in the Dead Sea itself. But there's one problem. There are huge mountains between Jerusalem and the Valley of the Dead Sea. Which means this is no ordinary river. For somehow it has to go up the mountains to get down into the valley. Ever seen a river go up the mountain? But then look what happens at the end of verse 8. The river enters the sea and when the water flows into the sea, the water will become fresh. And this means little to us if we don't know much about the Dead Sea. Well, the Dead Sea is called dead for a reason. Hardly anything can live in the Dead Sea. Ocean water is about 5% salt. The Dead Sea is about 25 to 30% salt. The Dead Sea is so dense with salt that you can go to the Dead Sea, sit down in it, and go out and float with no flotation device. Yet the messenger claims that the river will flow into the sea and make the water fresh. Now think about how unusual that is. If we mix an equal amount of seawater and fresh water together, what's the mixture going to be? Salt water. There's going to have salt in it. If you have a bowl of clean water and a bowl of dirty water and you mix the two together, what's going to happen? The clean water becomes dirty. But here the reverse happens. The fresh water from the temple changes the saltiest water on earth into fresh water. And another interesting fact about verse 8 concerns the word translated fresh. For my Bible translation has a footnote to the word fresh and it says Hebrew will be healed. So in Hebrew the figurative language used is the water will be healed. So the fresh water flowing from God's temple heals the Dead Sea water. And what happens when something or someone sick is restored to health? What happens when something dead is brought back through resurrection? Life happens. And that's what happens. In verse 9, wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live. There will be very many fish. For this water from the temple goes there that the waters of the sea may become fresh or be healed. So that everything will live where the river grows. And you see that on the bottom of this picture. Where at the bottom you see all kinds of vegetation. And you see animals in the river which is in an area which is currently a desert with no life. 
and there are fishermen that will stand beside the sea in verse 10, one on the western side of the sea in En Gedi, one on the eastern or northern side of the sea. And notice where the fishermen are. They're not in boats going out into the sea to fish. They are standing on the side of the sea, throwing their nets in and collecting fish, indicating an abundance of fish. In fact, the varieties and abundance of fish in the formerly dead sea will now rival the Great Sea, which we know as the Mediterranean Sea. And then in verse 11, the swamps and marshes remain salty because salt has some good purposes. But then verse 12, which is critical. The messenger comments on the trees on the both sides of the riverbank. He says, and on the banks on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. Now, if you've read the book of Revelation, you might recognize those words. In fact, if you turn to the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, and look at verses 1 and 2, or just listen to verses 1 and 2 of Revelation 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So John, in his writing the Revelation, gets his image to describe what he sees from Ezekiel 47. And Ezekiel, in writing and trying to find words to describe his vision, uses the Garden of Eden imagery, which all points to God promising that a new Eden is coming for all his people to enjoy one day. Now, think about how this description would encourage Ezekiel's listeners. It brings them back to the Garden of Eden, and the time when humans walk closely with God in this beautiful garden, but they're not going to go back in time. They get to look forward to this life, this new Eden life with God. And I would summarize this passage this way. Ezekiel shows us that the water flowing from God's temple brings life and healing both to the earth and to God's people its people. But then the question is, what does it mean? Like, what is this really? How, how, what is this portraying? Is it going to be a literal river or is it symbolic or what is it? And my answer is, I think it's a bit of both. I think when Christ returns, well, I know from the scriptures that heaven and earth are going to join in some way. That's the big picture that we get. God's going to dwell with his people on the new earth, the renewed earth. And this is a picture of that, where we will enjoy God's presence and he brings us to this restored Eden to enjoy his beauty and bounty and healing. But I also think this river portrays a spiritual, re spiritual reality that we can taste today. And so the water symbolizes the life and healing and restoration that God brings to his people by the Spirit. And I get this from Jesus. In John 4, where he meets this woman from Samaria at a well at noon, the hottest part of the day. And she comes probably at that time hoping no one else is at the well because then she won't have to endure the shame and the scorn that people will throw at her from the town because of her past life and her current lifestyle. 
Yet she comes up to the well, and Jesus is sitting there, and Jesus says, will you give me a drink? And the woman notices that he's a Jew, and she's a Samaritan, and there, there is tension between the races. Jews think that Samaritans are unclean, so she's surprised. You, you're a Jew asking me for a drink? And Jesus answered in John 4.10, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Well, she thinks, oh, so he wants to give me a drink. Well, where's his, where's his bucket? Where is he going to catch the water that comes from out of the well so that he can, you know, offer me a drink? She says, you have nothing to draw water with. Like, where are you going to get this water? And Jesus answers in John 4, 13, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And she thinks, that is water that I want. It must be some sort of miraculous water. That if I drink it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be healed or something. So yes, I want that water. But then Jesus gets to the heart of the matter. Her lifestyle and choices reveal a brokenness deep within. Yet he doesn't condemn her. He invites her to come to receive the living water. It is through him, the Christ, the Messiah, that this living water of new spiritual life can be found. And she is so taken by this that she leaves her water bar, uh, jug there, runs back into town, forgets all about the shame and scorn that people are going to throw at her, and says, come to the well and meet this man who told me everything about my life. Could this be the Christ? And she brings a whole bunch of people from the town, the Samaritan town, and John 4 tells us many Samaritans in that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony and later more believed because they meet Jesus himself who has talked about himself as the living water. And then later in John, Jesus says in John 7, 37 to 39, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of him will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So I think that the river in Ezekiel portrays a future reality and a current spiritual reality that is fulfilled today. The river pictures life and the healing we experience in God's presence when Christ returns, but it also portrays the spirit coming into our lives when we receive Christ. And it starts as a trickle of water and turns into an immersive river as we give more and more of ourselves to the Lord. The trickle of God's love, healing, and ministry in our lives can make dead bones come to life and turn and transform dry valleys into lush gardens. So this image portrays the ultimate fulfillment of God's purposes for this world he will one day bring healing to the earth and he will bring healing restoration and eternal life to those who come to him today here's where you and i come in what are we going to do with this well first of all since god's living water brings healing life to the earth and people we must dive in not just dip our hands in a little bit, although that's probably the way we start, but we must dive in. Are you holding back from God? Are you holding back those parts of your life that you don't want God to touch? No, he wants to touch them all and bring healing and renewal and restoration to it all. So we have to, we have to dive in. Well, how do we actually do that since there's no, like, river of water we can dive into that we can see right now. 
Well, first of all, you need to receive God's saving love and healing work in your own life. All of us need God's restoring work, God's healing work, God's saving work. So when we receive Christ into our lives, we begin this journey of walking with him. And he reveals to us as we walk with him, oh, that, that area of your life, that, like that's sin. And sin destroys you. And sin hurts you. And sin hurts others. And then he exposes that and empowers us to overcome it by the Spirit, by the living water. And then we continue to walk along. And then maybe Jesus speaks to us in our lives about some lie that we've believed, some deception that we've adopted. He says, no, that's not true. I am the way and the truth and the life. So you've got to leave that lie behind and begin living in the truth, in light of the truth. And Jesus ministers to us as we go along the way. He ministers to the hurts done to us, to the sin done to us. He does not speak from a life of privilege. He grew up in poverty. He had to work to survive. He ministered among the outs, outcasts. He likely experienced racism and classism or mockery because he was from the lowest class. He experienced emotional pain because of the death of his earthly father. We believe he died at some point early in Jesus' life. Joseph did. He experienced being misunderstood by followers. He was betrayed, denied, and abandoned by his closest friends. He faced false accusations, slander, physical, verbal, and emotional abuse through his trials. He experienced excruciating pain going to the cross and on the cross. I mean, Jesus knows hurts and wounds of life. And he died sentenced to death as the worst criminal in the society, though he was completely innocent. <laughs> he knows. And yet he's not bitter. And he's not frowning and he's not out for revenge. He is the living water who brings perspective through his teaching, forgiveness through his blood, healing through his comfort, salvation through his death, and life for us through his spirit. And he invites us to receive him and the living water that he brings. So first, we need to receive Christ as Lord, Savior, and living water. Second, we need to engage in Christian practices that connect us to God's living water. You all know some of these. Prayer, Bible reading, worship, community with other believers, communion, baptism, serving together. And all of our ministries are designed to facilitate and to encourage these practices of connection to the living water that Jesus and the Spirit bring to us. And then, thirdly, we share Christ, the living water, with others. And you share your story with people. And you especially talk of the saving, cleansing, healing, and restoring work of God in your life. And you pray that God may use you to create thirst for the living water that can only satisfy souls the soul's deepest thirst. So, if you're here today or watching online and you have never received Christ, I want to invite you to accept his invitation for you to come to him today. You need to believe that he is God the Son, the Savior of the world, and the Lord over all. But it's not just a belief thing in your brain where you say, oh, yes, I believe that Jesus is God the Son, just like I believe that there's satellites orbiting the earth. I can't see them. I believe they're there. I believe God the, the Son is there, but it makes no difference to my life. No, not that kind of belief. It's a life committing kind of belief. God the Son means I worship you and I come under your lordship and authority and I need you for life every day. That's step number one. And then secondly, if you're already Christian, you might have wandered from Jesus lately. Maybe you've been going to other sources to try to deal with the hurts and the wounds in your life. And you're trying to mix that with Jesus, but you know what happens with dirty water and clean water? It doesn't, it doesn't work. You've got to leave behind or turn away from those sources and turn back to the one who offers the pure living water And some of us just need to go deeper into the river today. 
uh, and maybe you're going through a lot right now. And you just need the Lord's healing and saving and restoring. And remember the question we started with, does God care about the pain in our lives? The answer is yes. He provides a continuous, growing, permanent, life-giving stream of healing, living water from Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And so I'm going to pray for you. And then I want to invite you to turn to him and to receive what God has for you during our closing song. And Lord God, we come to you today and we thank you for this revelation of your all-encompassing love and healing work for this earth and for our lives. And like that man who came into my office many years ago who was so broken, you care about him and you care about us. You know what's gone on in our lives, Lord, what we've been through, what we've done. And yet, you call us to yourself. You have this amazing ability to turn dead sea water into fresh water. And so we ask you to turn and heal the things in our lives that we thought could never be healed. To turn them to life. Turn them to wholeness. Enable us to see truth, to receive and walk by your spirit. As we continually taste your living water until we see you face to face. Will you minister to us now? We pray in your name. Amen.